going to get into One Health and it seems like ILRI has been working or ILRI scientists both in integrated and biosciences have been working on One Health for a very long time. Um, and we've got this opportunity to get everyone on board. So with the way we're going to do this is I'm going to quickly um, bring our experts and we're going to ask them a bunch of questions. Um, and Michael confirmed that we can put our questions in the chat box and in the mentee. So we can try and address some of these. Um, and I encourage everyone to try and go to the new Zoonotic landing page, uh, which shows what we've been doing. So, Eric, are you there? I am. Good morning, everyone. So, Eric, we have the first question for you. We're going to give you um, five minutes, and I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, and we're going to start with what's the difference between a pandemic and an epidemic? And why did WHO take so long to declare a pandemic? <laughs> okay, so I guess I, there are a few, a few definitions that we should probably start with before we get to pandemic. So can I okay, so first is the term endemic, which is important to, to know. Uh, an, an, an endemic disease is a disease um, which is found amongst a particular group of people or animals in a particular geographical area. Um, in a stable fashion. And it comes from the Greek word endemos, which means native. Um, and basically, examples of this might be malaria in sub-Saharan Africa, broadly speaking. A disease called echinococcus in Turkana is endemic there. The common cold is endemic globally. Um, and um, African swine fever is an endemic disease in Kenya. Uh, we then move to a, a, a sort of slightly higher level definition, which would be an epidemic, which is somewhat more unstable than an endemic disease. And it comes from the Greek, upon the people. And an endemic disease is a disease that's spreading amongst an unusually extensive group of people uh, uh, or, or of individuals in a population or in a community or through a whole region. And so, for example, there might be an epidemic of African swine fever in China at the moment, uh, an epidemic of obesity in North America, so it's not all infectious diseases, an epidemic of malaria in, in Mombasa during the rainy season, or an epidemic of foot and mouth disease in, in the UK in 2001. That would be another example. So that's what an epidemic is. And then a pandemic is simply an epidemic, but at a much bigger scale. Um, and it, it comes again from the Greek a pandemos, which means belonging to all the people. And, and really a pandemic is an epidemic that's occurring worldwide or over a very large area, crossing international boundaries and affecting a very substantial population. Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah. So Eric, after you define these, tell us why, do you, why did WHO take so long to declare this to be a pandemic? So there's a, there's a degree of politics, of course, in that uh, declaration process. The first thing WHO did was declare COVID-19 as a, a public health emergency of international concern, or, or PHEC. Um, and that basically says, look, this thing is spreading. We need to watch it, and we need to mobilize funding to potentially deal with, with a problem that is growing. Um, and then declaring it as a pandemic essentially says it's out of control. Um, so going from epidemic up to pandemic, uh, you, you have less and less control over what is happening. And of course, WHO is an organization that is managed by its member states, and no member state wants to put across the fact that it's not got things under control. And so there was some, some degree of hesitation, I think, associated with the degree of control of transmission that was going on. Great. Um, so Eric, this isn't the first pandemic and we've had some previously, which I'd just like you to give an example on. And also just to share with those people who, who aren't sure about One Health in terms of what are some of the lessons that we can learn from pandemics? So there, there, have, been, there have been several pandemics, thankfully not lots. There are animal pandemics and human pandemics. So I would say that African swine fever is, is reaching pandemic levels on the edges of Russia and Europe because it's spreading in multiple countries, uh, potentially in an uncontrolled way, although our African swine fever expert co uh, colleagues may wish to comment on that. Um, H1N1 was declared a pandemic. Zika virus uh, was briefly a pandemic. Plague in Europe was certainly a pandemic. Spanish flu in 1918 was definitely 
HIV was a pandemic, so we, we may often forget that, but there was a pandemic pandemic scale transmission of HIV in the late 80s and uh, up to the early 1990s. Uh, and some might say that blue tongue, which is an animal disease also. Um, so yes, yeah, so you want me so to move on. In, in the last minute you have, uh, maybe you can summarize, <laughs> how do we prevent future pandemics? What are some of the things we need to do? First of all, we need to do surveillance, a lot of surveillance. And in the context of One Health, that means doing surveillance at interfaces between animals and people, both wild animals and domestic animals, and also accounting for the environmental envelope in which transmission has occurred, but also addressing many of the root causes of, of transmission at those interfaces, particularly encroachment of into, into new environments or poor management of complex interfaces, which might be uh, with virgin forest or might be the urban interface or it might be some interface between urbanization and wildlife habitats and that kind of thing. So it's really about managing the way that we interact with the natural world. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much for that. Um, can we have Delia? Hello. Delia, I wanted to find out um, what, for those people who, who don't know about One Health, what is a One Health approach and why does it matter? Yep. Yes, well, there are several definitions of One Health, but they all have something in common. In fact, I can say they all have three things in common. Uh, firstly, is the integration of the three healths, human health, animal health, and ecosystem health. And here I say integration, because I think we're all used to um, different disciplines working in the same project, but working in their own silo, side by side. And every year they meet up and they tell each other what they've done. In One Health, this actually requires integration or closely working together. Another component, another essential characteristic is its work at the intersection of the three healths. So we often show these three healths as three circles, like a, like a Venn diagram, and one health is where they come together. So if you work on foot and mouth disease, you may be indirectly helping human health, um, but if you work on Rift Valley fever, you are very close to helping human health. Uh, so we're talking about the intersection. A third aspect is collaboration and adding value from collaboration. Again, we've often seen that when we work across disciplines and One Health requires not just working across health disciplines, but also working across other disciplines such as environment, ecology, gender, socioeconomics, that working across disciplines can sometimes add transaction costs. We say a, an approach is One Health where it is adding value. So the benefits of working together exceed the costs. So that's how I would define One Health. Okay, and then Delia, so then why does it affect all of us? And in, in, and in terms of um, what are some of the gaps that exist right now in One Health? Well, at the moment, the world is living in the midst of four great One Health crises, four, four problems which arise at the intersection of these three healths. And they are, one of them we're talking about today, which is emerging infectious diseases. Eric has summarized, I think all of us know about COVID-19 if we don't know about other, other emerging infectious diseases, but Eric drew our attention to some of the important ones of the last decades. Uh, there's also the endemic. We heard about the endemic, the, the diseases we have always with us, the endemic zoonoses, which are diseases transmitted from animals to people. And in fact, if you look at the actual health impacts on poor people, those of the endemic zoonosis like pork tapeworm or some of the foodborne diseases are probably greater. Um, the third crisis, that takes me to the third crisis, which is food safety. Um, food safety comes from agriculture, uh, often makes animals ill and definitely makes humans ill. Um, and that, that is another uh, one health problem. And finally, antimicrobial resistance, where uh, the, the, the three quarters of the world's antimicrobials are used in animals, and yet a huge human health impact is already with us. By 2050, AMR resistant pathogens may be killing more people than cancer unless we start taking stronger action, including action in agriculture. 
Thank you. Um, should we be worried about getting COVID from livestock uh, companion pets? And should we be worried about consuming uh, animal source food if infected with uh, COVID? So there have been a very few cases across the world of uh, COVID being detected in uh, cats, large and small, and one dog. Um, Many of the, the lead organization, European Food, Food Safety, CDC, um, World Health Organization have looked very carefully at these two questions you've asked and their conclusion is unanimous. There is no, at present, there is no need to be concerned about acquiring COVID-19 from either animals, pets or food. So that is at least one thing we don't need to worry about. Great. And in the last minute that you have, um, can you share what, or actually you have a couple of minutes, uh, what are some of the myths that we should, uh, what are some of the myths around um, uh, One Health and pandemics and what should we, what should we be really concerned about? Well, we've mentioned one of the, the, the main myths and that is that food or animals may now be having a role in transmission. Um, so, so that's an important one not to worry about. I think a potentially dangerous myth is that home cures uh, can be effective and that we can rely on them. Another myth is that we can just rely on, 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 on single actions like masks. We know now we should all be wearing masks, but wearing a mask is not enough to protect you. You also need to observe social distancing, good hygiene, wash hands frequently, and all the other advice. Um, there's many myths around, I don't have time to go through them all, but there's also many sources of good information, including the CDC website, the World Health Organization, and the Ministry of Health in Kenya. So I would encourage you all to Google those and, and, and get, bring yourself up to date on, on COVID. In terms of what we should really be concerned about, well, I think there are two major concerns. One is that nearly all the, the, the sickness and death has occurred in quite a small group of people. And those are elderly people with other health problems. So those are the people who are most at risk and those are the people we need to make sure are isolated and are kept as safe as possible. My other concern, and that's especially in Kenya and other low and middle income countries, is that the impacts of attempting to control this, 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 this truly serious pandemic can in themselves have many, many serious impacts in terms especially of people's access to food, to work, to livelihoods, and how we can manage that trade-off to bring the disease under control without causing too much damage to livelihoods and economies. And that's, I think that's it from my side. Thank you, Hector. Thank you, Delia. Thank you so much. Um, for this next session, I would like to have uh, Christina, Bernard, Ashley, and Hung available. Um, I wanted to start with Christina. Um, we know that we've been doing quite a bit of stuff and Christina, could you please share what we're doing here at ILRI with respect to One Health? Yes, hi Ekta, uh, greetings from Germany. Um, well, what I wanted to talk about is our new One Health Center at ILRI. Uh, just before COVID-19 took off in China, uh, the German government allocated 8 million euros uh, for a period of five years to build up a One Health Center at ILRI. And the purpose of that One Health Center is not to reinvent the wheel. Uh, it's more about consolidating all these One Health efforts that we have already included in our research research at ILRI over the past two decades or so. So we are, this uh, One Health Center is going to be some kind of umbrella for all the One Health work that is going on at ILRI. We are trying to consolidate that research. We want to complement it by, for example, better integrating with our environmental health uh, colleagues and socioeconomics. And we are attempting to scale activities that could be a training of frontline One Health practitioners in our various uh, project countries. Uh, it could be uh, reaching out to policymakers by better science communication and therefore influencing their decision making. And as I said initially, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. We're building on what's already done in Urban Zoo, in Heal, in, Ho in the Horn program, in the BUILD program, and many others. And the core thematic areas of the One Health Center are food safety, zoonotic diseases, 
and antimicrobial resistance. So over. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, and uh, Christina, in terms of uh, the One Health Center itself, um, can you share just a little bit about sort of activities that we plan to do? Because there's quite a few popping up everywhere. Um, so what would be unique about the one that we have based at our place? Well, I think unique is uh, that we are going to reach out to not only the Ilri internal One Health activities, but also to others. Right now, we are uh, setting up some kind of uh, yellow pages One Health uh, activities directory uh, by mapping One Health initiatives across Sub-Saharan Africa, which will be the geographical focus of the One Health Center at first. And we actually, I think the novelty is to actually give that platform and forum to discuss and then actually get things into action. Because what happens in research, we have our little three to five year projects and then we just move on. We don't work with the results. We don't build on what we have learned. We don't communicate with other research um, projects. So I think that One Health Center can give this platform to, uh, yeah, to take research into use. Thank Hopefully. you. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, Bernard, are you online? Yes, uh, Hector. Thank you, Bernard. I know you've been doing some really exciting things and uh, I'm always excited to talk about them, but I'll let you, you tell everybody what you've been doing. Uh, and also, what else are we doing beyond uh, your work on, in the One Health space? Okay, thanks. I think the previous speakers actually have alluded to some of the things we do. And I would maybe mention a few uh, because I think there's a lot large portfolio of research we do on One Health. So the first would be the emerging and zoonotic infectious diseases, which Eric actually leads. And here we do lots of work looking at transmission patterns of diseases between livestock, humans, and wildlife. So this has a lots of partnerships between the veterinary community, the, the human health community, and also the environmental community. And maybe you have heard of many projects which fit there, like the zoo link, the, the, the horn, the heal project, you know, all those really helped to address this specific problem of how diseases jump between livestock, humans, and wildlife. So that's one. The second other body of research is on what we call diseases in agricultural landscapes. And this tries to look at how land use change and environmental change enhances or precipitates diseases to occur. And so you've heard of things like irrigation, being an intensive form of agriculture, which helps uh, to develop mosquitoes and so transmit vector-borne diseases. You have heard of things like invasion into forests and diseases coming out. And that's, a few years ago, we had Ebola research in Uganda, which really gave us a very good risk map of where we think Ebola could be. Um, it was done by a colleague from Australia. The other portion of work which we have been doing a lot is climate change and Rift Valley fever. And that really helps in developing risk maps for diseases. And that's what policymakers usually like using for planning surveillance. What Eric was talking about, surveillance between uh, human and, 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 and livestock interface. So that's the second. The third, which I briefly mentioned, is food safety. And that's what uh, Delia mentioned. And it really has lots of One Health approaches. Because there we are looking at using market interventions to enhance food safety. And this is where people like Sylvia is doing lots of work on more milk projects to look at how uh, we can build capacity along food value chains to reduce on, on food safety issues. There's lots of work on aflatoxins, lots of work on food safety work in Tanzania. And, and so there's lots of all these things happening at the same time. But in general, I think they use one a framework looking at one health across animals, humans, and wildlife. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bernard. Um, Arshni, are you there? Yes, I am. And actually, what I wanted to do was to, no, I'm not able to share my screen. So you don't get to see a very pretty picture of AMR and why is AMR a one health issue. Um, 
I can share that at another time. So basically, as Delia pointed out, with AMR, uh, highlighting the gravity of, uh, of the issue of AMR on animal and human health, and really with, AM, with AMR or antimicrobial resistance, it arises in humans, animals, and the environment. And these ecological niches are so interconnected or interrelated with each other, so you have this beautiful transfer of AMR between the different niches. And therefore, if you really want to have an impact on addressing AMR, you need a multi-sectorial approach. So intervention in all the different sectors in order then to reduce AMR ultimately or the burden of AMR in, uh, in, animal, in human health. And at, these, at the AMR hub, what we're doing is that there are a number of projects trying to produce very valuable data to or evidence to show the, the agricultural contribution of AMR in, life, in, sorry, in low and middle income countries. And this is incredibly important because in high income countries like in Europe and America, we have a lot of data showing or highlighting agricultural risks. Um, so what we are trying to do is to produce this data so that ultimately we will inform uh, interventions that will eventually reduce AMR in the different sectors and then eventually reduce AMR in humans. So Arshi, just one more question for you. Um, you know, everyone, AMR doesn't have a face. Uh, you can't see it. You can't come and say, I'm a recovery of AMR. So how does that play in um, into this One, whole, one Health? Um, where, where can you find it in these different systems that Delia uh, made reference to? That's the difficulty because there is, like you said, you can't really, there's no face of AMR and, and, and it's why it's also been dubbed as the silent pandemic. And really where it is, is that when you look at the number of people that are dying from AMR or the animals that are lost in productivity, uh, uh, animal productivity, and that's, you kind of see the effects of it of AMR and not AMR per se, unless you were a microbiologist working in the lab, then you could see it. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much, Arshni. Thanks so much for that. Hung, can you please tell us what you guys are doing in Asia as far as One Health is concerned? Okay. Hello, everyone. You know, I don't want to compare the quantity of work on One Health from Asia uh, to Africa because we have much less uh, work here. So that's why I want to come back a little bit in the history that when we started One Health or rather Eco Health that Delia mentioned from the beginning 10 years ago in Southeast Asia basically building the capacity of One Health and Eco Health for local partners here. And now the ongoing work on One Health in INRI in Southeast Asia uh, focus on two areas. One is more research, and the second one, I would say, capacity and policy translation. And in research, uh, we map into treating zoonotic disease and infectious disease. Uh, so with that, we work on various uh, uh, neglected uh, diseases in pigs, uh, rabies, uh, uh, dengue. We have also uh, food safety, and uh, uh, actually food safety is main work here in, 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 in Vietnam and Cambodia. And uh, lastly, uh, the AMR work that uh, has been started recently. So, so we have various small pieces of work, I would say, and uh, we try to translate it in capacity and policy, and for that we work on three things. We've been up some of the Eco Health or One Health uh, resource centers in Thailand, Vietnam, and Indonesia. So we have three, and we, we try to continue. And the second one, we develop kind of policy task force, and mainly on food safety at the moment to work more with national and, and policy maker level to translate some of these things into practice. Thank you, thank you, Hung. Um, thanks so much for that. Um, if I could just um, get everyone to still um, ask some questions uh, or collect the questions you have before I move to Ian, Dieter, and Jimmy. Um, and also just, um, I know Bernard mentioned the HEAL project, the HORN project, so just go to the ZooLink, uh, the, Zoo, uh, the Zoonosis website, um, the new Zoonosis landing page to get some of that content out. Um, I'd like to see if Ian's online. Ian, are you there? Yeah, hi, Hector. Hi, Ian. I wanted to find out what are some of the opportunities that we have in One Health and what are some of uh, the gaps that, that, that you foresee? Okay, thanks, Hector. So I think, you know, Ilda is really well placed. Uh, Delia has mentioned some of the areas that Ilda is working on, zoonotic diseases, both uh, endemic and, and emerging diseases, food safety, AMR, and so on. And, you know, we have a lot of capacity in Hillary to tackle those sorts of issues from a One Health perspective. And we're also fortunate, as well as having the kind of those, those technical uh, areas of expertise that we've got within the same organization, 
uh, expertise on um, ecosystem health, on climate change in particular, uh, on, on uh, economics, including economics of animal health, trade, uh, and we've got one of the strongest gender teams in the CGIR. So I think there's a huge opportunity to bring to bear these different disciplines in a One Health program. I'm not sure we're really taking advantage of that interdisciplinarity that, that uh, Delia mentioned. We've got to work harder to uh, bring all those together. But let me throw out a bigger vision. I've got a bigger vision for this. If you look at the challenges around One Health, there are technical issues, but many of them are institutional. When I was based in India, I was asked to be part of the advisory committee of an initiative on zoonotic diseases uh, led by the Public Health Foundation of India. And I said to them, well, why are you asking me? I'm not a vet, I'm not a medic, I'm not an environmental scientist. And the answer was, that's exactly why we want you to be on the, the advisory committee, because many of the challenges are institutional, not necessarily technical. And they were my role as being kind of independent of the three communities, as it were, was to help you know, bring those communities together and help this program build those three communities together. So I think we have an opportunity, a huge opportunity to think about the institutional issues. And I have a big vision for a truly One Health Centre serving low and middle income countries that really bring these communities together, a multi-institutional, multinational organisation, bringing together ILRI, but bringing together strong public health partners, strong environmental uh, environment and environmental health initiatives and partners. And Kenya would be a fantastic location for such a truly international centre. The new Centre for Disease Control in Africa is going to be based in Nairobi. The, the Chinese government has pledged money to build it. There are strong national potential partners in, 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 in Kenya. So I think we should think big. Think about how could we really have a truly multi-international, a multi-institutional international One Health Centre based here in Kenya with ILRI being one member of that consortium. Let's think about that. Thanks, Hector. Ian, thank you so much. That's really bold and ambitious, and uh, I like the way we're dreaming big. Um, hopefully, we can make that happen. Right. Dieter, are you there? Yes, I'm there. I think uh, we have to uh, keep in mind that there are more than 800,000 mammalian and virus birds, uh, bird viruses around, and that poses a potential risk to humans. That means pandemics come and go but they're coming and they will coming in a higher frequency as in the past. And as you all know, and uh, to address health crisis, a holistic approach and interdisciplinary cooperation, including human health, veterinary medicine, but also environmental and social science is needed. It was said before, but if I look at our One Health activities, the two last ones, so the social science and the environmental we have still a gap. We are doing that, a little bit of that, but we have to intensify our activities in here. And we are also asked by some of the donors how at Italy we can include better experts from the human health side. And you just remember Bill Gates when he said in February, in any crisis, leaders have two equally important responsibilities, solve the immediate problem, and keep it from happening again. And the second has the crucial long-term consequences, and that should be also a focus in future of our One Health initiatives we have. There are many activities going on in uh, very new technologies for point of care diagnostics, rapid vaccine technologies. So we are soon much better prepared to come up with new vaccines as we do today. But very important, what we also have to intensify in um, our current activities is the surveillance, looking at symptoms, because surveillance is one of the most important aspects of public health systems, and surveillance data drive our action and inform our decision and inform us of potential threats to the health of animals and humans. And this should be linked to data management. That's also an area where we currently are not good and where we have to intensify. So that's my uh, uh, view for the future of One Health initiatives. And uh, for sure, now is the best time to scale Iris One Health initiatives by widening the scope of our work and by extending regionally. Thank you.
Hey, Darren, sorry, I have one more question for you. Um, do you feel like we're very, you know, when everyone thinks of a epidemic or a pandemic, everyone comes to the science and looks at the bioscience. Do you believe that we as an institute are representing the integrated science more clearly in terms of climate change, uh, policies, uh, gender, or do we need to do more on that? Over. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's what I say. This is somehow a gap We're doing that but not uh, in, in a scope we should do it. But there are ideas and there are first uh, project proposals written. So this is something, you know, using all the activities in ILRI should support the One Health centers or One Health initiatives we have. And that's something we sometimes miss at ILRI, including all the programs and not just working with one or two programs. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Dieter. Um, Jimmy, can we close with any sort of uh, closing remarks in terms of what's the one message that we take away with One Health and uh, what does ILRI's future look like going um, as a, in, in One Health? Hmm. Hmm. Thank you, Hector. And thanks to all for those um, excellent contributions to this discussion. I am encouraged by what everyone said. It's an opportunity to take advantage of this crisis and to strengthen our work in this area. And as Ian said, think big and bold. I come to this based on my previous life. I had to be leading the bank's work at the World Bank's work when there was a real panic about avian influenza. And what that could do to the world. And there were some projections there that if we had a really serious pandemic, the world's economy could contract by 3%. Well, this is much bigger. Europe alone will contract by 15%. So I have been on this issue of One Health for some time because that was the recommendation. The way to control pandemics was to deal with, to have a One Health approach. We did lots of calculations about cost benefit, 17 billion a year with returns of over 100 billion, but even offered ways to fund it by taxing exports of meat and so on. After the pandemic had passed, no one bothered. So we, have, we waited until this opportunity and now we have an opportunity to represent the importance of this. I was criticized at the time for we created a billion dollar fund at the bank for the um, pandemic preparedness. And people criticized, why were we focusing on pandemic? Why were you spending this amount of money on pandemics? This is really for the developed world and so on. Now we see that pandemics is not only about rich people or rich countries. In every facet of this crisis we are in, the poor has suffered more. Lost their jobs first, no markets to sell their produce. We are going to do distance learning. Poor people don't have connectivity. The poor have suffered. So working in pandemics is not a loss to working on epidemics or diseases which are more common that we like, malaria, brucellosis, and others like that. So I am encouraged by what Dita said, what Ian said, and what all the speakers said about the opportunity to strengthen our work in One Health and really become a serious player. Not only in the areas we've been working on, the endemic diseases, but diseases with pandemic pot potential as well. The challenge there, they tell me, is surveillance. How do you surveil for unknown things? But we have smart people here, and I know we can make a big contribution working with partners to how we might um, deal with the issue of trying to prevent future pandemics. This is a good area for us to work on. Hopefully there will be some attention to come on this and we're well prepared, we're well teed up. As Ian said, it's not just the technical aspects but the institutional aspects as well. 
and we are in a good position to, to do both. And we have a strong foundation which have been built by Eric and Delia and Bernard and all, whom, and all of those who have spoken. So thank you very much for this. I hope Ilri as a whole and of course our CG partners online have gotten a better understanding about what is One Health, what are pandemics, how can we as a CGIR work to prevent and control them.